Rosemary Truman, founder and CEO of the Center for Advancing Innovation, and also founder and CEO of Ignite Social Impact, the first crowd equity platform for to, to democratize impact investing. I'm very thrilled today to welcome Steve Mandel into the podcast. He's a friend, colleague, serial entrepreneur, and he's the owner of Game Plan Enterprises. Welcome, Steve. Thank you so much for joining. Welcome. Great to see you again. And I'm very excited too. to be here today. Uh, so tell us about your background and journey. Sure, sure. So uh, I've been an attorney, entrepreneur in the sports and entertainment space for, for 30 years. Um, I've always been a serial entrepreneur in my brain, no matter what I've done. Probably started earlier. I'll tell you my earliest fun stories from a journey, but uh, needed money for the prom. So a uh, friend came up to me one day and said, hey, you know, uh, you know, I'm doing some window washing this summer. You know, I might do some things. I said, you know, I need some money for prom. You know, can I be involved? And he said, yeah, let's let's wash some windows. So I, I washed windows in the neighborhood and my first entrepreneurial experience and turned that into a window washing and gutter cleaning service that took me through high school, college and law school. Wow. So it was a really profound experience. And that's really what kind of propelled my brain into thinking more entrepreneurial. And I would take my little ladder and put in my little Toyota Celica and drive the cars and put up in the houses and knock on everyone's doors. So I was like a door-to-door -door salesman with my services. So I had like this beginning, like, you know, experience of entrepreneurship, but really kind of in the trenches, knocking on doors, selling myself and performing and having to do well. So I get more referrals. And so uh, it, it carried me pretty well uh, during that time. Um, and then uh, after that, I started to internship at a... Um, at a large sports agency in Chicago that represents some very famous athletes around, around the world uh, during my second year in uh, law school and stayed on. And then I took the bar exam and was taking a bar exam. There's a lag time, three months before you can actually start the practice. And so at that time, I started a dining club. And I said, <laughs> okay, I can't be washing windows right now because I'm going to go and, and do some other things. So I got rid of my, my window washing business, which served me remarkably well. And then I started a dining club which is basically two for one dining. And I drove my car during those three months and signed up like 120 restaurants all over and made a big book. And then I wanted working with that. And then that was my, my other exit. And I wound up selling that book out to what now is probably pe most people know is like the entertainment book. The entertainment book, that big thick thing with all the coupons stuff didn't have my regions and my restaurants. And so the predecessor to that company that bought them out was a company that bought my company out. So I had that exit and I entered the, the world of the real sports and entertainment space. Um, and, and so I started working with high level athletes um, and as a lawyer uh, doing all the legal work and negotiating contracts and really learning a lot. Um, and so it's been, it's been a fun journey on that side. Um, and then from there, uh, earlier on, I started a board game company with two of my partners and it just came from a question. We were sitting in a car driving. We said, you know, you know, our drop kicks legal in the NFL. And we said, well, I don't know. What do you think? Are they or are they not? And we don't see them anymore, but it's really basically when a player drops the ball and they kick it through the up, you know, kick it through the goalpost and they get three points. But that can happen anytime during the game. Lo and behold, it actually is legal. Um, but we uh, said, this would be a great game. So we went to Toys R Us, looked around, said there's no game. And they had this thing called the Wall of Fame. And uh, there was no games in the NFL that was really particularly like focused on that. And so what I did is uh, we went to the NFL and said, hey, what about doing an NFL trivia game? And they go, you don't know anything about games. You know, we like you. you know, we, we think it's a good idea. But what we'll do is we'll, why don't you go find a company, right? And so you find a company, bring them back. Then we'll, we'll see if we can do something. So out of the blue, without any education, we went to Toy Fair. Uh, and that year was basically January. And you like the story, so I, wait, I wait, wait, wait a minute. Toy, it, there's, a, there's actually a toy fair. Toy fair is a big, big, big function, right? Every okay. single year, where all the like, people come in, they show toys and games, and the reps go and the buyers go, and people, their hopefuls are there, and they and they have one, um, you know, at your at a reps office, and they got the other one um, at, at one of the big convention centers, and so um, it, it was an exciting event to go because I saw everything there. It was like a world. And so I had meeting after meeting after meeting and like nobody, my two partners too, nobody would take the game. They're like, you know, it's uh, truly pursuit just came out. It's not, it's not unique. It's too niche. It's too long. It take three years to, to process and do all of the due diligence. Anyway, make a long story short, went back to the NFL and said, look, um, no one's going to take the game. I know you like the idea. Give us a shot. All right. Give us a shot. We know how to market. Give us a shot. So I said, you know what? Why not? So they gave us a license. We didn't know what we were doing. We went out and got a packager to package hot dogs and burgers and, and Italian beef in Chicago. Got him excited going, I can't stand packaging all that stuff. A game sounds fun. Let's do it. 
We got our graphic designers. And anyway, make long story short, started a board game company. I bought out my partners at a board game company because I was really kind of the engine behind it. Most of the, the travel and sales and this and that. And they were going different places in their life. Um, and they were great at the time. Um, and so that's how Game Plan got started. So you see Game Plan Enterprises behind me. But that time was Game Plan and then GamePlan.com. And so from there, um, I had licenses and the company had licenses from the NFL, Major League Baseball, CNN, Caesars, Indy 500, NHL. And then I also did, um, I decided to get into more of a proprietary comp uh, uh, part of the business and say, why don't I just really create a game that, you know, people could commission you out for. So Holiday Inn was doing a kids eat free program and we were bidding on doing board games. And they said, well, can you do this magnetic drawing board? And we said, well, why not? So anyway, started resourcing along those lines. Make long story short, that's how Game Plan got born in my world. So I have Game Plan Entertainment, which is more of the celebrity side of things, with celebrities and sports and entertainment, and Game Plan Enterprises that I do a lot of things with really entrepreneurially. Um, I'm all digital business for apps, gaming and apps, fantasy football. And so I took my gaming experience and grew it and grew it a lot bigger. Um, and so uh, I wound up selling GamePlan.com because the .com has a great price. And so that's a little base. I'll, I'll, I'll let you break in here because you might have some questions, but that's kind of like the early phases of me and we could talk about the next phases moving on, um, but I have a lot of funny stories in between with it. Okay, all right. Well, I want to hear some of the funny stories. So why did, why did you go to law school? Um, I, you know what? Funny thing is, I've always looked at myself as kind of a protector of people in a way, even kind of my personal life. And I was always challenged about sticking up for people and, and trying to, you know, do the right things in life. And, and I like to speak. I like to argue a little bit and... and bring forth great uh, change if I can. And I found it was a great avenue for business, quite frankly. You know, I mean, I would have gone to grad school, but I found myself later in school. I wasn't really a student in high school and college as much. Second part of college, absolutely. I, I wanted to really focus on, and, and I did, and I really wanted to go to law school. And that's really where it settled in for me because I love that real life experience. I was reading about real cases and real life things that happen. And then you got contracts on one side and criminal law on the other side. And you know, when you got tax law and everything that you're going to be doing in business is at law, really at law school, quite frankly, because nothing gets done without a contract. Nothing. Nope. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Right. And quite frankly, unfortunately, there's disputes all the time. Unfortunately, I have to use mm -hmm. to say that. And there's nothing I haven't seen. So I wanted to be in the center of that. I like conflict settlement. I like, you know, I like to be the ability to come in and resolve things. And so it's part of my personality. But from a business standpoint, I've taken that education and I've expanded it to my entrepreneurial world. And that's why I consult with businesses on a global basis. I'm involved in football leagues and all kinds of stuff that we'll get into. Um, but I, they like my legal prowess as much as my entrepreneurial thinking. So I bring a creative aspect to what I do in my business. So you had mentioned, that's very interesting. Um, you had mentioned that you, uh, of course, you had the, the, the cleaning, the window washing business. And how did you exit that? You know what? I mean, I just called the people that I, I had my real regular customers and whatnot, and I just exited it. And I said, you know, I referred them to a few people. It wasn't like a saleable business. It was really kind of like cash on hand, walk in, do everything, you know. And so um, I exited just gracefully like that. I actually referred it out to somebody else that could use the work. And I, I think I probably referred out like maybe like 70 houses or something along those lines. Um, so uh, it was good. It was great. I kind of washed your windows two times a year and it fit my needs at the time. So it was wonderful. But it was really... Uh, great experience. And the physical, I always say this to people, you know, the other thing I really liked about that job, it was the physicality. Also, there's something about working in physical businesses in terms of like blue collar labor that teaches you something to do something else different in life. I know it might sound, uh, I don't know if it sounds logical to a lot of people, but there's something about the memory of me carrying that ladder around and climbing and hanging on gutters and almost falling a few times, oh, geez. <laughs> getting scratched to mosquito bites and bee bites and the whole thing because yes, yes, all yes. it's garbage you know, and standing in roofs and cleaning gutters out and stuff like that. I live in Chicago, so it was all goopy. <laughs> but you know what, though? It built character. It built character for me. I love that aspect. I, I have workers come to my house down. I go, you know, I did that. I know it's like I did move furniture and stuff all, all the time. And, you know, ironically, I go through uh, I go through the LaGuardia Airport a lot for business. And I was walking through and uh, and they were washing the windows. I stopped. I said, you did an amazing job in that window. And I, went <laughs> through, I go on to giving a lady a tip. I said, I used to wash wow. the it going. There's something, something that, that's emotional about it in terms of your start in life, but the physical part of it, and I, I'll talk about this later on my personality. I do some martial arts right now because I, I love to work out and train. It's like to be really in touch with my body, but 
the physical part about doing that labor to me is kind of like important. And even in, when I'm studying martial arts, it's all about being grounded maybe. And so I never lose that grounded aspect. And so I always look at myself in terms of like the window washing business is important to me emotionally. And that's helped me grow every day of my life. And that's why I tell the story. And, you know, actually I, I used to go to window washing as well. I used to look at people's houses and, and their lawns and such and say, think about what do they need improved there? And um, I'd knock on their door and whatever I thought they would need it improved. Um, I would say, well, I could do that for you. And I'll, I'll never forget what I was, and this is when I was really little. I think they, my neighbor gave me like five cents <laughs> I mean, to do something like uh, pull weeds. Cause I, I saw these weeds in the front of their, their flower garden. And it, it took me about a few hours. And I think that they gave yeah. me five or 10 cents. I was, yeah. <laughs> I was happy with it. it. People ask me other questions. Can you cut my grass? So I cut grass for a while too. Yeah. I was washing your windows in the gutters of the lawnmower and cut their grass. So I, you know, there's something about doing that physical aspect that, that sinks into you and really appreciates everything you do in your life from that standpoint. And by the way, I do really appreciate workers that work with me physically as well, too, around my house who do certain things because I have an appreciation for it. You know, I really respect it. So I don't know. That's just kind of my, my human nature. And so I really felt it impacted me. Did you ever care newspapers? I, was, I never did anything with newspapers. I, I had I had a couple of newspaper routes as well when I was young and yeah. um, it's, it's something you, you, you can kind of relate to. Don't enjoy this story though. I didn't have that experience, but what happened is my sister worked at the local mall, right? And people were like <laughs> at the time going, you know, washing windows, like, yeah, but that's not a job. Like, well, okay, I'm an <laughs> entrepreneur. It's a job job. And he's like, all right, somebody had a job at the mall. This is why it was still like the window washing service. And so I got a job at Just Jeans. I'll never forget the story. I walked in that day. It's dead, right? There's nothing really going on. And people are waiting because we were on a commission basis. I got like, you know, something an hour or whatever it was, plus commissions. And so one guy walks in with his girlfriend. Oh, no, I just got lucky. And I started showing him all his stuff. And before you know it, he's trying all these things. I had like the biggest commissions of the day. Okay. That's awesome. But you know what I did? I quit what? that night. It was over. One day I got my one day paycheck with everything. I go, I felt too good as an entrepreneur. I made my own schedule, my own time. And quite frankly, I made literally 14 times the money I was making there. I washed windows in the <laughs> 80s, making two and $300 a day, wow. $50 a day with gutters. I'm like, I'm doing that. Yeah. And I was working for like eight, $8 an hour at the time, <clears throat> you know, walked away 56. They took the t- you know, whole thing out. So I was like, this is, that's a no brainer. I mean, gutters that's- cost a lot of money to get. Yeah. I mean. And, uh, you know, and, and one of my favorite stories about working in an agency, um, there was my best learning experiences. I actually had a job offer to work there and get a salary. And right before I was going to take that job, it's probably one of the most important things that happened in my career. The guy I was working with said, <clears throat> you know, I think I do I have to do some cutbacks and stuff like that. I don't think I could pay you a salary. Like, this is me coming out. And I had, I had a student loan, big student loan at the time. And he said, but <clears throat> I'll give you a desk and 30% commission so i already had my experience as an wow. entrepreneur and i looked at it <clears throat> and i said to myself this is good for me because i could use the brand i could go out i could be the entrepreneur i am stir up as much business but i like the fact that i had great overhead i had great access and i worked on their cases and stuff too but i got a 30 percent thing as opposed to a salary mm-hmm. i wound up making three times the money that year that he would have paid me had to pay me a salary wow That's three awesome. times <laughs> get off my student loan in one year it was great, but it showed me the grit to get on the street and do what I need to do and create a business for myself. It's hard. And I'm saying that in this podcast because people come to me all the time and I coach people around the world and like, it's hard to make that conversion from salary to employee and like, you know, that, that short opportunity to a, I'm on my own needing to make money, put up my shingle and let's go. So, so what do you, how do you convince people that they should make the leap because that's really hard for some people, you know, for example, in the DC area where, where I am, you know, you have probably about 70% of the people around here that are uh, in the federal government. You have lots of entrepreneurial kinds of people that they have their day job and then they'll create a company, but sometimes the the company just never flies because they don't put enough time into it. Um, How do you convince people to make the leap? You know, I'm not going to use the word convince. How about coaching into a, really what they want out of their life and how to do it? A lot of times what I'll do is say, you know, why don't you hedge yourself a little bit? Start something entrepreneurial. It depends on your life situation. You know, it depends. If you're younger and you're, you know, 28 to 34 and you're like, I did a good job and I want to do entrepreneurial things. Yeah, I need a, they need an apartment. They could share they could, any number of things that they could deal with as opposed to a family 
you know, a five and you have to feed the kids and do all that stuff where I run in all these scenarios. Mm -hmm. I think you have to look at the business plan, the direction, the motivation, what they have in savings. And if sometimes people say, I really want to be this entrepreneur, I say, why don't you take baby steps, right? Entrepreneurs work 24 seven. Yes. Whether they like it or not, they're 24 seven, right? I like to say I work that, but my brain's going 24 seven as an entrepreneur, as opposed to working at a bank, it's probably not 24 seven. Great job. Right. But I think you turn it off at five o'clock when you're done. It's kind of like, okay, I'll deal with the transactions around. Maybe once in a while you have a crisis. The entrepreneur brain's going 24 seven because we're thinking up garbage and crazy stuff and everything else all day long and business plans and what, what I need to do next. So you think differently. So I tell people, as long as you're working a nine to five job and you want to think like an entrepreneur and because the entrepreneur thinks 24 seven, when you're off at five o'clock and the kids are asleep, you have to find that gap of time to help find that entrepreneurial flavor and spirit and take something small first. Sometimes people go, I need to take the sleep and do this bite off the big apple. I'm like, why do you have to bite up, bite up the big apple right there? You know what I'm trying to say? Take a big bite. The reality is sometimes it could be baby steps. Baby steps are okay. It's not all or nothing. It's like I train and work out all the time and I've been in a gym for, for you know, all my life because I love it so much. And I'd work out with people early on. They're like, every day, every day, every day, every day. I come in three hours a day. I go like, it's unsustainable. Work out three days a week or four days a week, unless you really love it. But a lot, most people don't. And I'd love working out. So I'll be there every day. But for the most part, I would always go in the very beginning of training like three days a week because I knew you needed to rest your body and your brain and everything else. You don't, you know, so there's a point where you got to balance things out. Okay. Um, so I think it's okay to take a baby step. It doesn't be all or nothing. So working out and training doesn't have to be all or nothing. And then what happens is these people that train like that, they get out really out of shape and they go, well, cause I put it all into it and I stopped working out for the last six months rather than taking baby steps. That's all. And doing it maybe one day a week or two days a week and maintaining it. So, um, can you give an example of, um, other baby steps in entrepreneurial, the entrepreneurial world? <clears throat> well, give an you know, example I'm, you can provide maybe, for. Yeah, look, baby steps for people, um, you know, look, baby steps could be anything from starting anything up right now. I talk about what's one business that's in front of everybody's eyes right now. It's e-commerce, okay? There's no reason in the world you can't hire somebody to build a website with e-commerce platform and find something to sell. I mean, go to Alibaba. I mean, people do this all day long and, you know, get items, market, go put it up there and start feeling what it's like to run a business, Okay. Um, baby steps could be, you know what, I'm going to be an investor in a new restaurant that's close by, but tell them I want to be active in the management to see how things are going and don't put that much into it. Don't risk everything in it, but feel like you're part owner and walk in and say, I'm, I'm an owner. That's a good feeling. That's why a lot of people put money in businesses like that. I'm an owner. That's why crowdfunding works so well because crowdfunding people are like, they, they don't necessarily participate in the bigger businesses. Like, well, I can't get involved with Facebook. I can't get involved with this, but but you could do a crowdfunding campaign or something, be involved as an investor and be a material early investor in a company that could really explode. So those are baby steps for me, right? But um, it depends on what your passion is, but really understand your business as much as you can um, and, and really be a sponge. I tell people this, I speak on at conferences with you know Sylvester Sloan and John Travolta and Vince Vaughn and Michael Douglas. I speak at this mega success event every year. Um, and I get up on stage and we talk about these things, but you need to know where the pockets of opportunity are and missed opportunity, you know, um, not to shift gears on you so much in this, but I, one of the first questions I ask everybody when I get up on the stage is, you know, what companies, you know, who should have been Amazon? You know, I don't know if you have the answer to that. You know, maybe you'll take a guess. What company in the nineties should have been Amazon? Okay. Sears. The Sears catalog was around for 150 years, went out of business in 1995 when the internet was exploding. All they do is take all those stores and all those products in that catalog, log it, and put it into some kind of e-commerce platform, Yeah. right? Yep. So, you know, we could go on and on with different who should have been what in there, but I always make that a point because I sold the Sears, my board games at the time, before they went out. And I was always thinking to myself, wow, they had everything in that catalog. It was cool, you know? And, and the funny thing about it, when I was a kid, my mom, when I was a baby, would buy my clothes. We get it from the Sears catalog. I used to cry because I hated it because I get <laughs> the shoes didn't fit quite right in the snack. Guess what? Now we're in all these years later. I'm buying from a catalog again, online, Amazon. Yep. <laughs> so anyway, the funny thing is that, that they, I think they had the opportunity at the time. Yeah, they definitely did. So you were talking before about um, martial arts and you like the physical part. And so what are you doing with martial arts? How does it help you? Uh, totally. It's all, martial arts is all about key and energy. And so it's really, you know, I, 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 I train in the traditional style of Shotokan 
And, um, and what I love about it is the fact that it's all about mental preparation and, and the key and the energy from the inner soul of your, of your body. And, and so that's how you exert power and exert discipline. Um, and so by doing that, it really, it kind of humbles you. Number one, it really does humble you because it's all about, you know, we're all one and, and respect thy opponent and respect thy, the others and, and, uh, respect people around you. So I make, I think it makes me a, a really good entrepreneur because I love to listen to everyone. If I can, I probably more limited by time rather than by you're not big enough for me type mentality. Cause I have people come and go, you know, I know it's not big enough for you, but and I go, don't, don't ever say that. Nothing's too big. It's okay. You know, everyone starts off and it's sort of, I started off saying the same things, but you don't have to say that. I, I mean, you're equal. And so martial arts is about you being equal and respecting everyone. You never know what's across from you. So it, it, it reinforces those emotions every single time you, you enter in the martial arts. And every time I go into a business deal, I don't underestimate anybody. I consider everybody smart. You know, I consider everybody having good ideas and good passion. Um, I have one pet peeve and is I, I don't like snobs. I don't like people who think that they have a superior you know, positioning of some sort. And, um, and so martial arts is why it, it rings with me on the emotional side and the physical side is the natural thing that comes from it. Cause it's all the kicking and uh, punches and <clears throat> strategies and understanding the full sphere of the body and the whole aura of the body to know how bodies, the whole body moves. So anyway, I, I find that to be a strong mental uh, asset that I bring to the table every time I enter a negotiation my whole career has been negotiating high-level contracts for athletes and entertainers. I sell TV shows, uh, high-level uh, athletes and, and coaches and things like that in the sports entertainment space. And then it merges into that world and my, also my entrepreneurial world. So I have to come at it from a very level-headed approach when I negotiate deals, understand what the other people are thinking. A lot of empathy goes into it. So that's my approach. And that's how it weaves together very, very uh, seamlessly. So you, you mentioned empathy. How do you, this is very important, you know, obviously a lot of people don't um, really see things from other people's perspectives when they're working on contracts and such. So um, can you just, can, how do you figure out what the other side wants? How do you, yeah, first how do you off, I, I, yeah, number one, I think I'm, I've always been very insightful and probably over analytical. So I think I'm one of those people that really kind of reads a room really well. When I walk in, I, I get a good sense. Sometimes I'm fooled. You know, I joke around with times I'm completely fooled by certain people. But I'll have to tell you that I, um, I always believe you have to sit in the other person's shoes in life, quite frankly. Um, you know, go, even going back to martial arts, I have to think about what that person might be doing, right? So on the other side, you know, I need to understand when you negotiate, what are their pressures? What are their... What's their motivation? What do they have to, who are they representing? What's going down with them? Or is it representing themselves? What do they need to get out of it? And I enter every negotiation as a collaboration, not a negotiation. You know, some people have a mentality of win, lose. And I never look at it from a win, lose. I look at it at the end, it's a collaboration. And I don't like to call yourself the victor because you have to work with people, right? You want them to respect you. So win, lose to me makes it like you kind of beat them down pretty good. And, and even though you want to win the best way possible, it's how you make the other people feel. And that's where the empathy comes in. I don't want to make anybody feel bad about me getting a good opportunity, but I always believe at the end, it's a win-win and never a win-lose or a win-loss. Why have that? I mean, if you're, if you're going to go to the next level, I presume it's a win-win. So, but I have empathy for people in general. And so um, I think it's good to have that approach because I need to understand what, what motivates you what your limitations are and why, and have a conversation rather than demands. So give us a, a, an, a, an example of one of your funniest or most interesting negotiations. Hmm. Um, you know, I mean, gosh, I'll tell you something. I, I had, uh, I have so many of them. I, <laughs> I probably have to tell you that one of my favorite negotiations ever. I told the story the other day is when I, was meeting some. I'm dressed in a suit and a tie, and one of my uh, one of my clients with me was a uh, was a high level uh, uh, entertainer, and we're doing a deal with with a group, and they go meet us at like Fifth Avenue and like 29th. And I'm like, what's what's over there to meet? Like was late night, and we walked all the way downstairs, and it was like a big huge square table, and there was karaoke machines around and everything else, and they just started coming out with like drinks and the food and this and that, and I'm sitting like this, and then. Uh, it was just a crazy scene there were a bunch of people and singers and dancers coming in there. It's probably one of the craziest negotiations I've ever had in my life. And they're like, why don't you, and, and the, the culture of the people I was with and people like that were like, 
come drink. We want you to drink, 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 you know, party. I'm like, and I'm not, I don't, I'm no, no more. I'm not really a drinker anyway, but I had to sit there the whole night like this. And I said to myself, I go, this bill is going to be enormous. Yes. <laughs> I just saw the, the workings on it. I go, I already ate. I'm fine. <laughs> I don't want any drinks. No problem. And the bill came. Okay. And, yeah. they, and, and they were fighting over the bill like this. I go, I knew it. The bill was like $9,000 just to have that night down there. But anyway, the deal to get done, did get done, but it was one of the craziest experiences I had. And quite frankly, at the end of the night, I said, you know what? Good deal. We did a great job. And there I am, I was doing the karaoke stuff. So that was a fun negotiation. But look, I've gone through a lot of tough negotiations before. I've been in criminal court. Probably, I'm very prideful to say that I've done a lot of stuff, even in criminal court, not because I like representing criminals, but I had um, I had people falsely accused of stuff that were athletes and entertainers. And I had to really work within the system to see how... Who become victims very, very quick, right? Yes, yes. Um, and I've dealt with a lot of that stuff. And I think it made me a better negotiator with everything I do, right? Because I've been in the trenches. I've done litigation in criminal court. I've done litigation as a corporate attorney. Um, probably the most frustrating and scary thing I've ever done in my whole career is representing my dad in traffic court. Oh, my gosh. Because <laughs> dad expects one thing. You better get me off. Like, you know, okay? So, you know, the only thing I can do to the prosecutor is walk up and go, it's my dad. <laughs> so it's... Anyway, funny thing is, I, I those are some of my funny experiences out there. But you know, <coughs> excuse me, one of my favorite negotiations is putting together a deal. Well, I'm one of the original founders, a husband and wife, founded a football league in India called the Elite Football League of India. And they said we want to bring American football to India, and uh, and I love the prospect of doing it. I just loved it. And I and he goes, meet me, let's negotiate a deal. And you know, instead of taking me to dinner and doing something fancy or something like that, he goes, meet me at Panera Bread. So. <laughs> I'm in Panera Brad. He lays everything out for me. I go, I'm in. I loved it. And so anyway, it's one of the businesses I'm involved in. very proud of it right now. I do a lot of business in India. Uh, Kurt Warner is a professional football player as part of that. Mark Wahlberg, the actor, is an equity owner in that. Um, their business is growing. I like the, love the people inside of that. And, um, and I'll never forget when you're talking about negotiations, I was raising the original money for the business. And I went and I met with one of the original investors who I met with, who I brought to the table. And I said, you know, we're going to come and tell you the story. And we met with him in a big country club and he's a billionaire guy. And, mm -hmm. you know, he's like 15 years ago. And he says, I love the story. You know, he had a lot of empathy. I love the people. It sounds like a story. He goes, let me, uh, you know, I'm gonna come out there and see it as well too. He already gave the money, he funded the company and it was all going great. And he, and he took his private jet and flew from New Mexico to India. Okay. Got off of the plane, looked around and said, this isn't for me. Got back in his plane and left. He goes, keep my money. Let me know how it goes. OK, so <laughs> it's funny how, you know, things go in your negotiations, how empathetic he is to help pe people out. But he didn't want to go there and like live and be there and be a part of everything because like, he lived in his country club aspect. And like, you got the plane, you got the plane over there. The traffic was like five hours to get like, you know, 10 miles out. And, you know, yeah. and the, I was walking in the streets and stuff like that. So I've had a lot of funny experiences like that with investors and people like that um, along the way. Uh, but I enjoy the challenges that are there. Um, so it's funny that you mentioned the, the funniest negotiation you had. The funniest one I had was um, with a group in, out of Helsinki and a company, and we were closing a deal. And they said, well, what do you drink? And I said, tequila. <laughs> and he said, so the board of directors, the head of strategy, senior executive team, we all went out to a restaurant and guess what? There was a line of tequila shots sitting there as we walked in and another shot on the table. And then, uh, you know, I was like sipping it like this. And the, the head of strategy looks at me and says, Rosemary, you're going to be heading up our strategy. So you need to drink with us. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so uh, um, later that evening, uh, it's pretty actually customary to dance on tables and, <laughs> and Helsinki. Now you're so, dancing on tables and drinking tequila. Okay. Yeah, dancing on tables and drinking tequila. And, um, and so we had, to, we had to sign the agreement at, at seven in the morning. We didn't get done until four. So, uh, you know, I went back to my room, I took a shower, uh, pulled out the final contract and reviewed it again. And I was there at seven and everybody was there. Was your signature straight? It was a little bit on the angle. Look garbled? Yeah. No, no, it was all, all good. Somehow I, um, after doing a couple hundred push-ups and some other things, I was, uh, got myself straightened out there. That's funny. So, it's great. Yeah. yeah. But you so, know. Some cultures are like that, you know, it's, it's, it wasn't the first time, but it was, that was the yeah. most memorable one for sure. Yeah, no, I've got a lot of memorable ones. Unfortunately, I, I'm under NDAs and certain things that I'd love to disclose them, but I can't, but I've had some crazy situations come up and, you know, um, 
But at the end of the day, um, I love one of the passions I have is just seeing a smile on the face of my team or person I'm representing or perhaps myself, you know, because I'm representing myself a lot in what I'm doing right now. And I like it because I had a mandate, you know, I represent other people for all my whole career. And I realized something that when I'm people are coming for deals right now to consult with their businesses, I'm representing myself and I want to represent myself. And I tell people this, you know, you want to hire a representative anyway, in any negotiation that represents you and kind of what you're like, you know what I mean? So um, anyway, I love to talk to people about their experiences because I always take away something. And that's why I never, I never, when I negotiate, never underestimate who's, who you're dealing with, right? You learn something from them. And remember one thing, I always say this, don't leave tire, tire tracks where you're going because the next time around, you're running into people. It's happened to me right now. There's a gentleman I'm doing, I did a lot of business with. He was on the other side of negotiating with me from a major network. <coughs> Excuse me for a sec. <coughs> so um, it was a major network and then he lost his job. And you know he said, hey, can you help me find a job? And, and so I met with him many times, became a very good friend of mine. And now he just got hired at a major corporation and now I'm doing business with him again. But he really liked the fact that I really took the time out when he was kind of a little bit down and out. Never underestimate who you're doing business with. Never look at what role that they're actually in and, and having to, to navigate that, um, you know, and, and think that they're lesser of what you're bringing to the table or not. Never, never, never look at people from that perspective. So can you maybe unpack a little bit about more about the tire tracks? What do you mean by that? You know what? People walk in and go, take it or leave it. And they act like, you know, really obnoxious and, and nasty. And they feel like that's the last negotiation or, or engagement they'll ever have with that person. The reality is that you have to look at your world and you have a reputation to uphold too. Look, everything doesn't go perfect. So I'm not saying it doesn't, but you do have some disagreements. But don't be nasty and like leave the tire tracks like I'm out of here and leave that burn mark mm. in the ground and like you burn a bridge. Yeah. I can't tell you people call me up like two, three years later going, you know what? I love what we didn't, the other deal didn't work out maybe, but I love the way you dealt with it. I want, I want, we represent us. I've been on the other side representing people and they call me up and go, I would love to have you on our team. Wow. Shocking out of the blue. But you know why? Because it's always been from respecting the other side. Mm -hmm. So, um, what are you doing now? I mean, you have so many programs and, and such going on, but where are you spending your time? You know what? I mean, look, my core business I have, which I love, is, is I do represent high-level people in entertainment and sports, okay, and marketing. But I'm doing an awful lot in entrepreneurial space, and I'm merging them together, so I'm able to take a lot of talent I'm working with as well and finding amazing opportunities where they come in as spokespersons or things like that. And so I love to merge those worlds together because I realize the talent I work with love opportunities outside their core world. You know why? Because the first question you ask, baby steps, they might have a great career what they're doing, but they're also looking to kind of augment the other stuff they have in place. So I love both of those things. And I'm a multitasker. I think it's probably my greatest strength is I can multitask. I've, I've had partners in the past where I've, you know, I have my own business now, but they were kind of like very linear and methodical and hey, you know, and can only really deal with one project at a time, which is okay, right? It's just not my, I'm not wired like that. Mm -hmm. I'm worried like, yeah, I could handle this, but I have teams in place, which is great. But I like taking on certain challenges. You know, I'm involved in so, so a couple of different football deals right now and, and product deals. I'm an advisor to the number one third-party Amazon product company in the world. Um, I'm an advisor to the number one event company, events.com in the world. Um, a product called Versus Game um, that is an absolute amazing uh, uh, digital game that you have on your app. Uh, a store, I'm involved in uh, so many verticals that I really enjoy, but that's the word, enjoy. That's what I want, what I enjoy being with. Probably one of the most profound things, Rosemary, I think we spoke about it before, is that there's a plastics alternative business that a gentleman invented, which is basically dissolvable technology. So if I have a bar of soap or something like that, that's plastic right there, that you could take off and, and dissolve it in your sink. Take your grocery bag. And so we have world and we have global patents on that. And right now we're doing bubble wrap and we're doing straws and all kinds of things it's going to change the landscape of the plastics industry because it dissolves. It is not compostable. It is not recyclable. It is dissolvable. And it is just the most amazing thing I've been involved in. And so where are you with that right now? We are, well, we're, we're, we're already uh, under contract with some huge development companies and uh, we're going to, you'll, you'll see product coming out probably within the next two or three months. Awesome. And uh, I fully expect it to be integrated in so many businesses we think that in the bubble wrap business and industry, we think that it's going to absolutely completely change the landscape because it's all plastics and look at all the plastics we're throwing away. 
every time you get an Amazon box and open that box up or a box from somewhere, it's got a plastic seal type uh, bag in there to help pad it. We, we, we think we can, we know we have it. We already have it now, right? We have awesome. the technology to take that out. And so landfills and plastics that take for years, people don't realize that recycling and compostable, that takes a long time. That still takes years to, to turn into like nothing, mm -hmm. but you can really take a bite out of our plastic and eat it. Wow. Amazing. That's a, that is amazing. It's amazing. And so, I, what, what's, can you uh, say the name of the company? The company's called Solubag. Solubag, okay. Solubag, yep. It's S O L U B A G? Correct, yep. Okay. And it's phenomenal. My partner's phenomenal from Chile. And uh, we uh, did a contract with my partner, Kevin Harrington. Uh, you want to talk about Kevin on his call as well, too. We talked about that. Uh, one of the first gentlemen from Shark Tank was an amazing, brilliant mind. Invented the infomercial and I uh, love his story as well, too. Uh, you know, so I won't tell the story, but I heard enough of the stories because it's great. I'm looking at products and seeing what works and whatnot. So it's expanded my world and the brand because now I look at products like the same way. I can see what works and what doesn't work and I can see how to integrate it. And then what I love to do is, and why we work well together is from a legal perspective, I know how to structure the contracts, bring them together, do licensing. Because of my board game business, I became a licensing expert. So I get people globally coming in on licensing deals. Um, because licensing products is enormous, whether you manufacture them or not. Baby steps, like we talked about earlier, kind of rein it in. Could be, I have a great product, but I don't, I don't have the time to manufacture. I don't have the time to, you know, I don't have the time, resources, or energy to do any of that. But you certainly can license it to a major company. And so, you know, I like looking for opportunities like that. I love intellectual property. As a lawyer right now, I ask the first questions I typically ask are whether or not you have a patent on it. Because I love patents. It's got so much brand equity you can build into it. So I love the ideas and I, and I like startups. <clears throat> I like people who've got great ideas. I've gotten more business opportunities and deals I've been involved with. People going, this is my idea. What do you think? You go, wow, is that great? Like fantastic, you know? So, um, you know, I got little gadgets and gizmos sitting in my, in my desk here looking at the different things that people send me all the time. And so I love looking at them and evaluating it. And that really comes from my board game business and toys and stuff that I was involved in because I lived it and I did it and I sold personally to Walmart and Target. I would sit with a Target buyer. This is a relationship. And I said, look, we're selling you the, the, the NFL game. We're selling you uh, the CNN game, which is a travel trivia type game with all news and stuff at the time. What can you use? He goes, gaming's hot. This is back right in the 90s. And so I made and went out and got the Caesars Palace license and made a great board game. And you can go on Amazon right now, get all my board games because they're, 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 they're out there as just collector's items. Um, and you take the dice and that was like three dice. And if you roll them and you got it, it was a jackpot. Like we had cards going and, and we actually developed based on feedback from them. And I was able to react really well um, as an entrepreneur from the pressures I had and deliverables I had and the, me, and the ability to, to please the marketplace is what I had to be an expert in doing. So did you, did you ever practice being an attorney in a law firm? Um, well, you know what? I mean, the sports practice I had in the beginning, I was a partner in was a law firm attached to the sports representation business. Mm -hmm. And so, but a traditional large, large law firm, no, but I, I'm working with them all day long in terms of deals I'm doing back and forth. But I practiced traditionally like an attorney like that in the very beginning of my career, which I recommend if you're ever become an attorney, absolutely practice in the beginning, because you're going to learn. And then you could take all those elements to the next level. And that's what makes me a great entrepreneur. I think today in terms of understanding every aspect, the marketing, but also the business and legal. I could start your corporation. I could do your SPAC. We could go public. You've got SEC work. You got intellectual property work. I'm well-versed in all those topics. So that's what I enjoy doing. So have you, have you worked with crowd equity platforms? Crowd equity. I've actually been partners with crowd equity platforms. Uh, one's Republic. The other one's Start Engine. Uh, you know, I've, I've done several projects with these companies. It's been terrific. Um, and so I think they're, I think it's a phenomenal way to raise money right now. Um, you know, going out there and raising capital is difficult. Everybody knows that, but everybody can be an entrepreneur and everybody can raise big money with the new mandates, like allowing up to $5 million right now. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, you could fund any company you want with being like basically putting in one shareholder pool as a trustee, not having to give up voting rights, or quite frankly, having like, you know, a hundred investors that might get angry and aggravated, you calling you all the time. It's, you don't get that. It also gives people participation at a lower level. They don't have that lot of money, but they can feel they're, they're part of a startup. It's a very cool aspect. I'm a huge, huge fan of it. And I'm using it a lot. 
And as you know, we have uh, we launched Ignite Social Impact as a um, the first crowd equity platform to democratize impact investing. So we're really excited about the new law, the, the, the new FINRA regulation that came out, as you mentioned, up to $5 million. So the game has completely changed from $1 million to $5 million. The accredited investors don't have a limit anymore. It used to be 107000 which is amazing. That $1,070,000, you know, exactly. You know, and also with your social impact, we've discussed this offline. I think it's amazing what you've created with the social impact fund, because guess what? Like Sally Bag, we talked about that being a social impact aspect, and we're, we're talking about what we might be able to do there. I think this motivates people because people are coming with ideas all day long and there's so much we want to do in social impact. It's our world. Yeah. Well, um, so what is your relationship with uh, Kevin Harrington? So Kevin and I are partners. I uh, also act as an attorney to put deals together, but they saw and where I'm, where I'm, where I'm at is a, just a big, better and bigger reach to be able to aggregate our deals together at the same time, coming up with ideas, distribution, and, uh, and the legal side of things where I can really help shape deals and structures where we want to go. So, um, you know, we evaluate the all deals. We've got literally, I mean, and, and Brian Harrington, his son's involved with all two terrific, terrific young brain. And, um, and so, you know, it's amazing the pitches that we get globally. <clears throat> it's amazing that we just, it's interesting to sift through everything. And, uh, and you realize there's great entrepreneurs out there, like massive amounts of entrepreneurs. And so, you know, it's it's voluminous sometimes, but at the end of the day, it's great to pick out some great uh, opportunities and really uh, go with it. Well, we're really excited to have you, you spent the time with us today. Um, what advice would you give to a, an entrepreneur, uh, given the new dynamics of getting through this coronavirus? Do you think there are any changes? You know or <clears throat> Number one, put the put any negativity behind you in your life if you can and just start somewhere. Right. It doesn't have to be all or nothing like, you know, come if you really want to be an entrepreneur, study it, but also don't do the other thing a lot of people may make mistakes with. They just, they're so, they're so desperate. They get something started, they go down the wrong path and they get so married to something. It really is like, you know, uh, Kevin O'Leary says this on Shark Tank all the time, you know, be, take it behind the barn and shoot it. <laughs> <laughs> well, people don't do that. And rather waste all your time and money and energy and fighting through. If you go out and try and sell to people and they're just not resonating, you know, sometimes it's telling you the message. I'm not saying you can't win through that, but a lot of times if you're sitting here doing a lot of convincing and it's not going or you're not getting sales and I've, I've, I've had a lot of companies coming to me going, I'm at it for five years. I've made 20 grand. It's like, it's the message. It's like, you got the right mentality, but don't keep throwing good money after bad money is the number one piece of advice I could say, mm. period. Okay. You have to look at objectively and understand your situation. And, and you know what? Winning isn't all about making a billion dollars. Winning is about going for it and, and having an opportunity to, to, to be an entrepreneur and change your world. And sometimes people aren't entrepreneurs. They might just want to have great jobs. My point to you about winning in life is not all about money. I mean, I'll tell you why, because I love teachers. Teachers teach everything, our kids and everything like that. And they're not making a billion dollars. Maybe they should get paid a billion dollars. But you know, whatever your passion is, reach for it. But don't do good money after bad money and anything because it's just not going to help you out and it's going to hurt you. And emotionally, it's going to take you down. And it's going to also make you a little, um, it's going to uh, make you obviously very, um, what should I say, gun shy about moving forward with other projects in the future because you're going to come back and think how stung you got. It's okay. Pivoting is key in business and coping. So how does someone know that they are throwing good money after bad money? You know what? Look, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why, right? Because number one, you can't afford it. You're going to your bank account. And you're not getting the rewards back and the investment back, at least of what you're putting into it. So it's a telltale sign. The other one is, you know, you're out there and you're selling, you know, for two, three years and your sales are $20,000. Okay. And you've gone through a lot of marketing agencies or groups and people like that. And it's telling you something. So it, it's not an easy test. To always break that down the exact same way as I'm explaining it. But the reality is you got to have, I believe mentors sometimes coming in and say, this is what you should do or not do, not be too mm -hmm. stubborn about that approach. Um, and realize that, you know what, if you're not making money at that after a reasonable period of time and you keep putting money into it and you keep losing it and you have so, so much of a burn rate, then you have to ask yourself, what, what's this leading to? Now, if you're a drug company, I do a lot in biotech, or if you're a development company or a SaaS model or a digital model, or you're coming up with an app, and you have a burn rate, but, but you're gaining you're gaining an audience, you're gaining consumers and, and acquisitions of, of, of consumers and users on your platform, but you're not making money. That's a different story because you're playing a different game. 
right? So it depends on the product and the category and the service that you're actually involved in to help define that. But you know, it's kind of like you, you, you know it in your heart when you see it, you just have to be objective with yourself. And sometimes people just are not. So Steve, you've given us a lot of really good tips for these, for our entrepreneurs. And, um, you know, you said, take, start small, baby steps, be a sponge, you know, look for pockets of opportunity, respect the opponent and others around you. Listen to everyone. Don't underestimate, underestimate anyone. Try to sit in other people's shoes when you're negotiating, what are their pressures, what they need to get out of it. Enter it is, is it a collaboration? It's how about how you make people feel, have empathy, what motivates them. Don't leave tire tracks, which is, I love that one because uh, uh, I don't think people hear that enough, actually. They, you know, there's a lot of emotional reactions. Um, put negativ negativity away. Um, don't be desperate. Don't throw good money after bad money. Winning isn't all about making money. Um, go after what you're passionate about. Pivoting is key. Um, try to look at the signs for pivoting, you know, if you can't afford it. If you put two to three years in and you're not making anything out of it. Um, and one of the things I like really loved that you mentioned before about licensing, you know, you, you might have an idea that you can get it out. You could license it to others, still make money. But, um, and of course, you know, that the center for advancing innovation, we're, we work with about 170,000 inventions and we're, we're passionate about pushing these inventions out into the world and uh, having them make an impact. Is there anything else you'd like to leave the audience with today? I'm really grateful for your time. No, thank you. You know what? I mean, look, I'm passionate about what I do. You have to show passion because when you're in a room with people and you're trying to sell your project, if you're passionate about yourself and what you're doing, you're going to sell other people on, on it, right? So never lose, never lose faith, no matter how, how hard it becomes, you know, because it, the pivot is always there. If you keep thinking everything is a straight line and linear, you're going to lose. Everything in life is, is pivoting. I tell people this. There's nobody in life Life's like a pinball machine. When you get in here, you're going to get bounced around a lot. There's no one that goes through and has a clear lane. No one. Okay. We all go through, through the same things. So understand that there's always a path, whatever that is, but be happy about it and learn from the mistakes and learn from the negativity and laugh it off. I look at life through funny goggles because if I didn't, you could sit there and go, oh, that was horrible. I can't believe what happened here. I can't believe here. I always look at something else as an opportunity. Say, that's a door closed. It's unfortunate. Yeah, maybe I'm upset. Maybe I'm very emotional. Move on. Cope. Moving on, coping, and pivoting is the most important thing for successful business people. That's it. And, and understand that you will find your way and your path if you keep the right mental attitude and, and never feel like you're down and out. You know, I, I don't like around, being around people that have that, that whole feeling like, you know, I'm, I've been wounded by the world. This is horrible. It's like, that's just such negative energy. Like, yeah. stop. So. I agree. Well, Steve, I'm very grateful for your time today. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. I think I you really need everybody's Friday. All right. And watch this podcast. You're amazing, Rosemary. Take Thank care. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thank Steve. You. Take care. Bye-bye.